In the United States, we call it doctor. Most of my patients call me schmuck or else uh, Mark. I'll, I'll, I'll call Mark Gordon, Dr. Mark Gordon. Uh, it's a pleasure yeah. to have you on the podcast, mate. And um, uh, I know you. crazy busy you are, and I appreciate your time. Um, first off, I thank you for for, your, for all the work you're doing with regards to TBI research, TBI treatment, pioneer over there. When I say uh, I thank you for the work you're doing, that's not just for the military community, especially a huge, making huge um, leaps in the USA. It's also having a big impact over here, as you know. I've just been watching Mandy Bostwick talk in Parliament on the same subject to do your, your research and, and treatment, um, but also for the, for the wider community, particularly the sports and people who, who suffer from TBIs and maybe gone undiagnosed. Correct. You are a fountain of knowledge when it comes to um, uh, the benefits of uh, hormone natural supplementation in diets, particularly in other ways of supplementing. Um, what I'd like to cover today, if it's all right with you, is um, this topic of TBIs uh, and the misdiagnosis of TBIs, uh, particularly where the conflicts of psychology and neurology come in. Sorry, let me shut That's my right. phone system off. Yeah. It's not a drama, mate. It's not a drama. Yeah. We've got, a, we've got a situation at the moment coming Well, it's been a situation that's been in existence for a while here in the UK, okay? It's now coming to the forefront of public attention. And that is, again, the misdiagnosis of uh, a mistreatment of TBIs, okay? On the one hand, you've got the military aspect. As you well know, you are years ahead of what the UK is. On the other hand, right now in the UK, we've got it coming to the forefront with where rugby is concerned, a contact sport, okay? Where you've got players who have been in this game for years, um, who are suffering from the symptoms of what would normally be diagnosed as a psychological issue, but isn't necessarily always the case with big lawsuits going on. My, my question to you to start off, Mark, and I'll let you take it from there, is this misdiagnosis and mistreatment of illnesses, uh, when we're talking about mental ill health symptoms, wh why, are we, why have we got this situation going on now? What, why uh, is it existing? Great, it's a great and very complex, uh, or layered, not complex, it's layered because there's so many uh, political and financial related issues here. The core of the um, answer is the fact that what we've been looking at is the superficial expression of an internal process that's happening. When you have trauma, regardless of it's rugby, American football, soccer, any kind of contact sport, any kind of blast exposure, IED or what have you, that it turns on a group of inflammatory chemicals, just the same chemicals we're seeing in COVID, in COVID infections, which creates a change in the chemistry of the brain. And that change in the chemistry of the brain is what leads to our presentation of um, different psychological uh, conditions, whether or not it's depression, OCD, bipolar, even Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. What we found in Alzheimer's to be more specific relative to American football is the fact that if one of our players has a on-the-field concussion, they are 19 times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease than the general population, and that's between the age of 30 and 49 years of age. So there's a contact sport trauma-related cause for Alzheimer's disease, but the treatment of Alzheimer's is, you know, psychiatric. It's not looking at the underlying inflammation. In the past year, relative to dementia diseases, they're now talking to the patients about, oh, have you had any traumas in the past? Automobile accidents, slip and fall, assaults, anything that can cause these inflammatory chemicals to be produced. Now, when the chemicals called cytokines are produced in the brain, they interrupt the brain's functioning to do something very important, and that's called regulation of our hormones. The hypothalamus is a sensor. It measures the hormones in the blood and then sends a signal to the pituitary, the master gland that sends the signals to the glands below our neck to turn on testosterone, uh, thyroid, uh, adrenal glands, and so forth. And there's interruption or disruption of this communication system that's precipitated by uh, the trauma. Now, let's talk about people who haven't had one iota, one single bit of contact trauma to their body. And how is it that under extreme stress, let's say someone living in a home environment where there, there's discourse between people, a lot of stress or a overbearing parent or 
um, you know, a conflict between a matrimonial relationship. What happens, is, how come they develop depression or anxiety? And we found a chemical over 20 years ago that's really come into the literature in the past seven, eight years called fractalkin. Fractalkin is something that protects the brain from inflammation, but under stress, it causes that chemical to drop. And when that chemical drops, the system of the body, the glial cells, the immune system cells in the brain start dumping inflammatory chemistry. So you don't need to have any kind of contact trauma. So in someone who has contact trauma and also has stress in association with it, it could push them over the edge. So they can have a mild trauma and add to it on top of that stress. And that stress will push them further into this inflammatory state. And that's why we see delays of up to 17 years. Can I ask a question? Um, Absolutely. You don't have to ask when, a question. Ask a question. Just ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> I have my ears pinned back there listening. Okay. Um, when the fractalkin is, uh, gets lower in the brain, why is the reaction to dump the anti-inflammatory chemistry onto the brain? What, why is that? What's that reason? Great question. The neurons, the nerves, the neurons produce the fractalkin and the receptors where it works is selectively on microglia cells. So under healthy situation, the fractalkin tells these cells, don't react, don't react, don't drop the cytokines. But when under stress, cortisol goes up, cortisol causes the neurons to stop producing the fractalkin. So the microglia cells now become reactive. And there are three phases of these microglial cells. There's one M0, which is the surveillance. They're just waiting for something to happen. And then M1 is the activated one where they start dumping things. And that's the active attack. And then M2 is the recovery where they drop the inflammation. So they go through three phases and you want to keep them in the surveillance condition so they can find bacteria or viruses that are attacking you so that they can then mount an immune response. And then the virus comes in, the bacteria comes in, and the cells react. And acutely, in a short period of time, they kill it. And then they transfer from M1 activated to unactivated or recovery phase. But under chronic conditions like repetitive blast, repetitive stress, these cells keep on dumping and dumping and dumping the cytokines as what happens in cytokine storm with COVID-19 or with influenza or with H1N1, with any virus, you can get um, an effect of these inflammatory cytokines going up. And you know it, we all know it, because when we get a, a cold, are we smarter or less smart? Are we foggy or we become less smart? And that's a clear, crystal clear example of how these inflammatory cytokines affect our cognition, our emotional stability. And we become irritable, light sensitive, sound sensitive, taste sensitive, even with influenza. Yeah, so, I think this is this is one of the revela sort of the revelations in my mind, especially after when I first spoke to Mandy and we were talking about you and, and everything else uh, on and off air. You know, um, one of the things that really struck me was that they do, is that you can get these these illnesses can be caused by non physical events. And I watched Andrew Marr's Quiet Explosions uh, a few days ago, right? And I urge anyone who's, who's listening to this to watch that. It's on Vimeo. In the UK, it's on Vimeo. You can go on Vimeo. But one of the things that really struck me in there was the cross-section of people suffering were from military. And it's sort of, okay, obvious. Traumatic, uh, blast traumatic brain injuries. You experience a lot of blast. Sports, okay, obvious. Uh, a lot of head, uh, head, head con uh, you know, trauma to the head, obvious. And then you had the other. Like there was a lady on there who was ex-Navy, but never been on an operation. But she was a rape victim suffering right. from exact suffering from exactly the same sort of symptoms as the military side the sports the sports star side and and and, and receiving you know sim similar treatment and resolving it and, and that's that's an emotional in, uh, emotional experience that she had it's one of the things that really opened my eyes to ah the the, the that view of 
or that, that thing that's going on where the total misdiagnosis of many, many, many of my colleagues and other, and, and other people in the military, just alone the military, from a psychiatry point of view, where it can be easily treated right. for the most part with right. neuroendocrinology, right? right? Yeah, uh, the, the problem is, um, as in treating dementia diseases, they put psychiatrists involved with treating people with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, uh, I mean, Alzheimer's and dementia diseases here in the United States. Also, they put in the lead psychiatrists to address the symptomatology that's on the surface uh, with people who have been exposed to, we'll just say, events that create neuroinflammation. I've been trying to get away from traumatic brain injury because when I write, it's traumatic and non-traumatic brain injury, x-ray, chemotherapy, certain medication can create the exact same symptomatology as someone who's had a, a blast trauma, IED. Um, the issue is I don't believe that psychiatrists are the best people. There was a paper written, I won't mention the doctor's name because I try to stay friendly with him, but wrote a paper where he basically said in the military who had blast trauma, who subsequently developed uh, depression, he says that it's irrelevant to the blast trauma. They would have developed the depression anyway. And Andrew talked about it when we were on Joe Rogan's podcast, uh, what was it, 1589 last week, uh, where uh, Andrew talked about it when we were talking about our um, our experience in the UK uh, in a committee who were talking about traumatic brain in the military, blast trauma. And a point that you made that's very needs to be really clarified is that you don't need blast trauma to develop a problem. The analogy I use is, and I'll make it into the British one, is you have a pound note or else you have a hundred cents. They both equal a hundred. So you can have a lot of small traumas that add up to a hundred or you can have one large one. And I have 50 caliber gunners who have never had, you know, trauma other than the 50 caliber gun. I've had guys who work in construction who use the jackhammer, which creates the problem. We have people who have been on a carrier, never deployed out into the field, who were working on jet engines, and they developed a unique syndrome, which is called uh, high, uh, high decibel, low frequency trauma. So the roar of an engine is enough to create inflammation in the brain because of how it disrupts the vibration, how it disrupts things. So, you know, mistreatment, I think it's, it's deeper than just mistreatment. I think it's, in addition, the misdiagnoses as well as you're not doing anything. What are the laboratory tests that a psychiatrist traditionally does? None. 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 Here in the States, none. We've trained uh, almost 30 psychiatrists. Now they're doing testing and they're finding the hormonal deficiencies that were precipitated by the inflammation secondary to the automobile accident. Uh, Dr. James Zender wrote a great book, uh, Recovering After Auto Accident, where he talks about a lot of the patients with PTSD. He's taken our class and he's now integrating the psychology into the pharmacology or the neuroendocrinology and seeing this, and that's what needs to be done. It's, it's not just because it happens, there's a biochemical reason for it happening, and that's what's being missed, the chemistry. It, 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 do you think that one of the blockers to um, the receipt of this in the sort of the medical world uh, and the world psychiatry just in general, is that, especially when we're talking about sports, we talk about military, you think money. You think impact like that, and is it a is there a perception perhaps that uh, this is what you're talking about here? If, if it becomes mainstream in terms of understanding, and it, it potentially has a catastrophic effect on sports, for example. Oh, we need to stop American football. We need to stop rugby. We need to stop boxing. We need to stop MMA. Um, is that the case, or is there is there is there a, like a is there a workaround? Is this is there preventative treatments that can be done? Is Go. Yes. Great question. Great question. I believe in something that we've been promoting called biological resiliency. Now, you guys out in the field of battle, you wear Kevlar vests. 
and you know you're going into a dangerous situation. And by the amount of plates that you have on your, your Kevlar vest or your vest will protect you from different forms of rounds or shrapnel or what have you. Well, we can do the exact same thing in, uh, for our bodies to protect us. And that is by having good nutrition, low alcohol consumption, good sleep, good hydration, and certain supplements like vitamin E, alpha, uh, gamma tocopherol, like n cysteine, like omega-3, uh, omega-3 fish oils. Uh, Dr. Uh, Michael D. Lewis, um, I talked about him on um, Joe Rogan, and I presented Joe with a book from Mike, which talks about um, brain uh, trauma and the use of fish oil, because how fish oil works is to improve the preventive Kevlar in the brain and turns on two proteins that protect the brain. So these are um, important means that you can use preventatively going into the ring for MMA or going out into the field playing rugby or in the United States playing football. There are things you can do to give you a little bit of extra protection because the helmets, they really don't do very much. Helmets just keep the trauma localized to a small area. There is jarring of the head. Remember, the brain sits in a fluid and floats. So there is the law of physics with momentum that once an object is set in motion, it tends to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. The outside force is the other side of the skull. So you're slamming it up against the inside, whether or not you have a helmet or not. So it's about the external force. You still get knocked to the side, and that's enough. We've had people who have, uh, we had one case a legal case where the guy was rear-ended at maybe five to seven miles an hour, and he developed symptomatology relative to uh, traumatic brain injury, and then on blood testing was corroborated. So these helmets and so forth, they're good to keep the disfigurement of the outer uh, shell or the skin uh, under control and keep all the pieces together, you know, put everything together. But as long as you have um, rotation, lateralization and to and fro, uh, you're going to have the potential. Most of the damages that we see in auto accidents, talking about outside the military, is this coup counter coup in, uh, injury where you're driving your, your vehicle and you stop short, not even hitting anybody. You just stop short and the brain will slide forward and then backwards. So you get frontal, frontal lobe trauma and occipital lobe trauma that affects vision. And we've had a guy who was T-boned, hit on the side, and his head hit the side uh, window and smashed it. He didn't lose consciousness, but he ended up some years later with hormonal deficiency. And when we looked at his hormones, there was the pattern that said it was due to trauma to the head. And he had forgotten he was 41 years of age. It happened at 18. He had forgotten the accident. But the laboratory test showed it, you know. So um, it's about biological resiliency is really what needs to be done so i you i know you work with the military over there or some military units it's a bit structured or different over there the way you can engage and and with the sports side of things can i ask are you on the sports side for contact sports are you working with any um top level teams and if so are they putting any protocols in place for this this preemptive protection no, no. they they're very resistant because in, you know, what happened after um, Dr. O'Malley, who the movie Concussion came out of, Will Smith played it, what happened was he got a lot of flack because he was going up against a major industry. And they say, oh, my God, this guy's coming out here with information saying that these people are, you know, creating CTE or traumatic brain injury or fractalkin related stuff. And no one wants to admit uh, uh, utilize certain things or do certain things because it's acknowledging that the problem exists. If I want, if I say, you know, stop, stop football, stop MMA, because there's a problem there, you don't talk about it because you don't want that sport stopped. Or else if you say, you know, you can use, you know, X, Y, and Z to protect you, but in saying you need X, Y, and Z to protect you implies that there is a liability from the sport. That's where there's so many lawsuits going on, okay? I worked um, with a, uh, NFL retirement teams, retirement teams, as well as during my 
1990s up until 2000 and maybe five, I worked with a lot of players um, that were still active and were having problems. I did two ESPN outside the line. Uh, let's see, one in 2006, that was about why sports individuals had difficulty healing because the hormones that we produce in our body are not just gender or sex hormones. They influence healing processes in our body. So in 2006, I talked about that. And then 2007, January, was um, James Tony Lights Out Tony, a pugilist. And uh, I'd worked with him for maybe 10 years. And um, he, number two was more about traumatic brain injury and the impact on emotional, psychological um, functioning relative to traumatic brain injury. You know, so... Um, it, it's an uphill battle because people don't want to totally accept it because it implies danger, but there's a lot you can do to protect it. And I don't think that the helmets are the the final word. What, what, what's the answer then, Mark? Because it's going to come to a it'll come to a head, and it's going to have to be something done. And what what people I don't want to happen is rugby gets stopped, American football gets stopped. You yeah. have to have a military. You have got to have a military. So that's right. always going to exist, right? What what is the what's the balance? What what is where do you see uh, it ending up? Well, yeah. Well, in England, as I read a year ago, if not longer, that there was the no heading the ball if you're less than 18 years of age. Uh, Schools, well, you know, because that repetitive, the repetitive issue. And I've got a couple of guys who played soccer, Americans playing soccer here um, with uh, the coach was from uh, England and, um, you know, developing symptomatology and, uh, you know, problems uh, because it's the, the banging repetitively is frontal. It could be any part depending upon how you flick the ball off your head. Uh, you know, there have been. Uh, books written about traumatic brain injury where they talk about the different angles of impact. And in fact, Hippocrates talked about trauma to the skull back then. Okay. And there was a book, the thesis on head trauma by, uh, by Hippocrates. And he actually said that during the winter months, uh, people survived better than in the summer because the cold, they put the snow on it and helped them with the swelling. But during who is it? Who is Hippocrates? Hippocrates. 3,000 years there? ago or whatever, yeah. Okay. Sorry, yeah. I interrupted. Go on. No, no, it's no problem. So, uh, you know, what's the bottom line is um, improving your resistance to the trauma, and that's internally. Um, you know, they take people off the field after they've been, uh, they had a concussive impact. They take them off the field. Instead of in the past, they'd send them right back into the field when they could stand up and count three fingers, you know, even though you had four showing. Um, so they're protecting the players. That's good. Hopefully the players are taking better nutritional care of themselves because of the benefits of certain of the, uh, components that we use that have been shown by, um, you know, our, uh, Bethesda, Maryland, um, the military research center, uh, NSCL cysteine, very good for, um, pro uh, not prophylactic. It's prophylactic and also treatment for, the uh, inflammatory changes in the brain. That's what has to be controlled. If we can minimize the inflammation or the inflammatory response, people will do a lot better. And that's through nutrition. Alcohol creates inflammation. We know it. When you wake up after drinking too many, you know, brewskis, uh, too many beers, uh, Watney Red or whatever you in, indulge in, uh, what happens is that um, irritation of the brain and that irritability you wake up with light sensitivity and hearing sensitivity and smells and all that is the same thing as trauma. It's a chemical trauma. It's a non-traumatic trauma to the brain. So nutritionally, physically, good physical activity brings up the um, level of fractalkin. It also brings up the level of, um, what is it, uh, just blanking on it, endorphins and enkephalins which are very protective of the brain. Um, also, here in the United States, we have CPD. CPD down-regulates an inflammatory process in the brain. The cannabinoid receptors, the endocannabinoid receptors, uh, they have benefits. And we, in certain states, as well as medical use of CPD and marijuana, we're seeing benefits. I don't prescribe because our 
products work very well. Yes, people come in on it. I don't stop them. Let them continue doing whatever they're doing if it's working. But uh, there are biological, there are biochemical, there are physiological pathways that have been shown the benefits of uh, CBD, cannabinoid uh, 1 receptors. So these are things that can be used for pain. I talked to uh, a vet yesterday who found it was night and day for pain. He didn't need opioids. And the problem with opioids is that they shut off your luteinizing hormones so you can't make testosterone. And narcotics don't treat the underlying problem. They just mask it. They make you think that the pain's not there. It's done nothing to the biochemistry that of what creates pain. And pain's created by these inflammatory cytokines that are precipitated by uh, a transduction or a transducer um, called NF-kappa B, which is a genetic switch, turns on the production of these inflammatory chemicals. And opioids increase that. So you're why taking- would they, Why would they, Go on. Yeah, opioids why, why, increase the pain, uh, pain production, pain chemistry production. Why were the cannabinoids positive? Why do you they work? Well, yeah, what they do is they downregulate this NF-kappa B. To go back in, put into sequence, when you have trauma, this receptor gets turned on, this um, uh, transducer, transduction uh, area called NF-kappa B. And that turns on the production of cytokines, specifically interleukin-1, 1B, interleukin-6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. And what they found is as these inflammatory cytokines go up, your perception of pain goes up. So there's a unique issue when you give opioids it affects a receptor called the mu receptor, which is anesthetic, so you feel less pain. But at the same time, it turns on another receptor called a toll-like 4 receptor, with, and all this can be looked up. Toll-like 4 receptor, which increases NF-kappa B, thereby increasing the production of inflammation. So the reason why people get breakthrough pain is because the level of the inflammatory chemistry exceeds the ability of the narcotic to produce anesthesia. So you get breakthrough pain. So what happens? You increase the narcotic and then the inflammation increases. And so we've had people who have gotten off of uh, one guy, one Marine, uh, Scott, who got off of uh, methadone. And we have a whole bunch of people who have gotten off of smoking marijuana, drinking alcohol, uh, opioids, narcotics uh, on protocol because we dropped the inflammation. So they're requirement for narcotics is less because of that whole cycle of teetering up and up and up with the opioids, the mu receptor, the toll-4-like receptors, and the generation of the pain chemistry. So in my new lecture, I talk deeply about the biochemistry of uh, this interaction and relationship because it's so important. That's why I, don't, I haven't prescribed narcotics in 15 years. No need for it once you fix the inflammation. It, it sounds to me like it has a, the, the treatment has a massive impact on cognitive ability as well. I mean, in terms of if you're a Joe Average, and this, I mean, I'm thinking about it, this is the way to live healthier, right? But what, what's, yeah, so what, what's the treatment look like? What, what's the treatment look like for someone who's they've too late, they've got the, got the head trauma, they've got the symptoms, as you know, a bunch of people, I know a bunch of people, and what what does the treatment look like? How uh, in terms of the scope of it, the duration of it, um, how intrusive is it? Yeah, um, there there are two avenues that we're working on right now. Um, one is the traditional academic, where we draw blood and we look at their hormonal levels that have patterns to suggest brain involvement, and then we put them on two products, two groups of products. One are the specific hormone deficiencies. We replenish it, whether or not it's DHEA, pregnenolone, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, pregnenolone, anything that comes up in their labs, or if they're deficient in cortisol. And if adrenaline- and these, are all natural. these are all natural, these, these are all natural chemicals, yeah, right? Even our testosterone comes from Mexican wild yams. Our DHEA comes from plant. Now in the United States, um, we have estradiol uh, patches that come out of Mexican wild yams. Uh, progesterone, um, which is called, I keep on forgetting the name, the natural progesterone, Prometrium, 
is made from Mexican wild yam. So they're all bioidentical, bioequivalent, and phyto hormones, phyto from plant, natural, and they work. Prescription. And, and, you, and you need to, I'm, and I'm just correct me if I'm wrong, and you need to introduce them this way, and sorry, source them that way, because these things are very difficult to prompt your, your brain to produce, to produce them when they've been doing it in a deficient manner. But by reintroducing them from whatever source you get them from, a bioidentical, it right. kickstarts the brain back into operating properly. Is that right? No. Well, what it does, it, it supplements the deficiency in the brain. So what we tend to do is try to not do that. Our first line of uh, approach is using a group of products called CIRMS, which is Selective estrogen uh, receptor modulators, stimulators. And what we can do is fake the brain into increasing the production of luteinizing hormone, LH. LH is responsible for turning on the entire hormonal cascade in our body. Luteinizing hormone is the rate limiting factor for taking cholesterol and making it pregnenolone. Pregnenolone on one pathway becomes DHEA uh, testosterone, DHT, estrone, estradiol. On another pathway, pregnenolone becomes progesterone, allopregnanolone, cortisol, cortisone, and aldosterone. So that's how important this pregnenolone is and how important luteinizing hormone is in starting the process. It's the, called the rate limiting factor or a hormone. It allows the system to work. So we start up there. If we give just testosterone, it shuts that system down. So we don't tend to do that at the start when we're treating our male patients. We use something to get the brain to increase luteinizing hormone, okay? So that we don't disrupt the communication pathway between the higher area hypothalamus, the pituitary, the master gland, and the glands that are below the neck. Otherwise, we can... Uh, diminish the re ability of those circuits to function. People who are on, for instance, people who are on um, cortisol for a long period of time, it will shut down a chemical produced by the pituitary called ACTH. And that will might take a long time to come back online or it might not come back online or it might come back online lower. So the brain can't produce enough cortisol. ACTH from the pituitary goes to the adrenal glands and turns on cortisol production. So you can have diminished responsiveness. So you're stuck. You got to keep the person on cortisol. Okay. In testosterone, you put someone on testosterone. And what happens is the brain says, okay, is testosterone level in the blood good or not? It says, oh, it's fantastic. Well, stop producing luteinizing hormone. And if it stops producing luteinizing hormone, over time, the testicles or the gonads are not being stimulated to stay on. And what happens is the cells responsible for producing testosterone called Leydig cells, they will atrophy or shut down and you might not be able to turn them back on because you've been on testosterone for long periods of time. And that's why when I got started in hormone technology back in the 80s, I was really just trying to help guys who had been on very high levels of anabolic steroids help to reconstitute their system or to restart their system. And that's how I learned about these different modalities. The most common is beta HCG which is human coronic gonadotropin, which uh, helps to increase um, the production of uh, testosterone in men and testosterone estradiol and so forth in women. So um, what we try to do first is that great adage or that great statement is first do no harm. And the first do no harm is find ways to get the body to do its own work, to raise its own level of testosterone, estrogen and so forth. So you preserve the circuitry okay yeah no it's uh it's, it's uh your death and knowledge is astounded <laughs> <laughs> well uh, i have to Quick. be right on point because i get uh quizzed and attacked and attacked and quizzed yeah um so a question for you with regarding so we're talking about like the traditional treatment of uh, of what be perceived as psych, uh, psychiatric issues or mental ill health issues would especially amongst the military communities i see it um, 
you know, the diagnosis of PTSD, depression, and all these other things. And you'd hit those first with psychiatry, or uh, you'd only hit them with some form of psychiatry, CBT, or whatever it may be. Um, in your experience over time tr treating people who have been treating people, especially in the military community, um, how is the need for psychiatric treatment as well? Is that greatly diminished or is it still needed for, for patients that you're treating afterwards? Because there's still uh, a place for it there, isn't there, on occasion? Correct. It depends uh, on. Yeah. What happens is <clears throat> people who come to us are on a multitude of antidepressants or antipsychotic medication and they still have depression okay and because it's usually four or five years since um, they've been on this psych psychiatric foundation of treatment and assessment they have now developed a persona of being depressed they're now accepted they I'm depressed so they play out the depression card. So the psychiatrists that we either transfer them to or they go back to their psychiatrist who sees, man, you've gotten better. I mean, we've had this where I've gotten called by psychiatrists saying, what are you doing for the patients? What are you doing? I have a, a Air Force captain in um, Arizona who six weeks into her program, uh, her speech impediment disappeared and the psychiatrist said to her, you don't need me anymore. Okay, but they're needed for talk therapy to help them to get to the come back to who they were. Let them know that they've now improved. They can be the same person they were before they developed and were put into this groove of being a depressive person or a anxious person or paranoid or whatever. So um, I leave it to the patient to make their own decision about uh, whether or not to continue with the psychiatrist. I don't badmouth anybody because everybody serves a function as long as they're working for the patient, as opposed to working for some other narrative that they're on. Also, as I said, I think almost 30 psychiatrists, we've trained 20, two of them went through our program, four of them were military. And they realized that their foundational approach to what's being called PTSD uh, which I call symptomatic TBI, um, that their foundational or their conventional approach is not working. If the conventional approach was working, we would not be seeing 22 to 40 suicides a day. We would be seeing zero. And then I'm proud to be interacting with a gentleman from uh, Washington, uh, John Spagnola, who helped to pen a, uh, a new bill that makes it mandatory for the um, VA when they dispense an antidepressant to um, one of their veterans that they have to explain to them that it can cause an increase in depression and increase suicide ideation when they get started on these antidepressants that are supposed to help diminish depression. But a lot of people have a bump up in their depression and suicide. Now by law, they have to explain it to them and give them a paper explaining it. So it protects them because there was a, um, uh, a congressional committee meeting where the senator who was, um, uh, who was running the, uh, the um, uh, commission, the hearing, the commission about why in the military are there 50, deep percent higher suicidal deaths than in the um, civilian population. Why is there twice as many deaths in the military medical than in the, in the uh, standard? Okay, that's because they give them, uh, as the vets have told me, uh, they're handed uh, baggies of um, happy pills, is what they call it. You know, and here, take bag number one. That doesn't work. Go to bag number two. No biochemical testing done. Nothing. And then when they tested, and then when they tested for hormones, like what happened with Andrew, is that he his level of testosterone was so low because the blast trauma that put him out of commission had disrupted his ability of the pituitary or hypothalamus pituitary 
to make luteinizing hormone to turn on his production of testosterone. It was so low, they accused him of taking testosterone. So they didn't treat him for, I think, a year. You'll get it from him when you talk to him on this program. Um, they accused him, as I've been getting a lot of guys saying, well, they accused me of using something I didn't use because they didn't understand the blast trauma and neuroendocrinology, which, thank God, they're starting to look at. We've been doing it for 20 years, but they're starting to look at it. You know, medical time, yeah, medical, uh, what's it called? Um, Military Medical Times wrote uh, a paper where they acknowledged the fact that they had to go to the uh, civilian doctor's population to get information about hormones and trauma because in the military they hadn't a clue and they acknowledged that okay. it's a complete disservice we, we talk about it calmly here um you're right for time oh no no that's fine yeah, yeah we, we we talk about it calmly here and it, it, to be honest when i think about it i try and stop myself thinking about it too much because it infuriates me i've got a i've got a friend a colleague i used to serve with and he's he served time in prison he was diagnosed with ptsd uh, several years ago he spent several years in prison and it's an absolute nightmare i when i was listening to mandy bostwick talk in parliament today one of the figures i didn't realize over here in the uk so before the start of the iraq war uh, which is 2003 the percentage of the, the UK population who are military ex, or ex-military incarcerated in prison was around about 3%. Since the start of the Iraq war, it is now 13 to 15%. They're the largest sub-cohort in, 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 in prison now is ex-military. Yep. It, it's no, it, you know, correlation doesn't equal causation, but I'd argue in this case, it's flipping well, you know, it's, pretty, it's a pretty strong indicator of something going wrong, you know. Um, and that mistreatment and misdiagnosis it, it is... And it, what annoys me is this is, going to go, this is going to go on, as you know. You've already been battling it for a long, long time to try and get things to change. And that's starting now over here. And your impact is having Europe in the UK and with your colleagues here in the UK. And, but it's going to take several, years, years longer for organizations to get their acting here, to get the right reviews, the right monitoring in place, the right advice and guidance and you know, supplementation, military side and the sports side. So a, qu- a question for you. I am I am an elite sport. I'm not, but I'm an elite sports athlete in a contact sport. I am a soldier, an airman, airwoman, or a sailor of you in, in the military. The the right system is not in place to protect me, uh, protect my brain, protect my long term mental health. Okay, what can I do to what can I do to help myself moving forward now in this day in the UK now? What advice would you give in terms of I don't know. We got the good diet, and you got the good, and the, you know, maintaining exercise. But on a additional, um, what else can I put into my body, and how can I treat my body to to combat what you were talking about, what we're talking about today? Right. Well, we have a a, a product um, which is called the Tri Pack, uh, which has gone through a total of sixteen years worth of uh, clinical assessment and modification, and uh, we're. We're doing right now a project with the military, with the Marines, and in one month, they've recorded a 42% improvement in a multitude of areas, whether or not it's personality, migraines, or cognition, or sleep. And the Tri-Kit has in it uh, three bottles, and one of the bottles, which is one of the key products, is called Brain Care 2, has in it six components. It would be 18 capsules if you would take it uh, take it by mouth. 18 capsules. This is a teaspoon. We use a technology called nanoliposomal, which we started using back at uh, 1999. And it helps with absorption, gets it into the blood a lot faster. But the composition of these six products that are equal to 18 capsules or one teaspoon of our liposomal product are all anti-inflammatory products <clears throat> that get into the brain. And we did a study um, using those cytokines, interleukin-6 and interleuk- and tumor necrosis factor alpha, and we put people, took their blood tests and then put them on the product, and then three months later we took another blood test, and the people who had the deepest drop in these inflammatory chemicals interleukin cytokines had the greatest positive responses okay so anti-inflammation is the key so we all have a degree of inflammation 
I've had people say, oh, I've never had any kind of trauma. Well, you were born, you learned how to bicycle ride, you roller skated, you skateboarded, uh, you did football or soccer, rugby or cricket, or, you know, you had a, um, a very trying childhood uh, for obvious reasons, for different reasons, or you used to jump off of uh, roofs, you know, uh, trying to fly or, you know, you jump, whatever. Uh, there's a whole multitude of um, causative factors that we totally ignore. You know, I was hit by a car at uh, 12 years of age on my bicycle. It was one of the six things that created a problem for me when I was in my 40s that led me down this pathway for the last 25 years. So um, the products, specific products, and acetylcysteine, if they go to the website, they can download uh, information sheet, which will tell them every component and what every component does. And there's about 500 references that they like reading. So they can read the science that went into it. I read about 8,000 articles, but there's some key articles which I brought to Joe Rogan, which you can go to um, my uh, website, tbihelpnow.org, go down to the science and where it says Joe Rogan fact check, I supplied him with articles to check all the things that I've shared with him and sharing with you now about the relationship between inflammation and all forms of um, psychiatric problems. And the and the, the comedy here is the fact that when I presented this in uh, the Imperial College and talked about this 2017 article that equated every single one of the psychiatric problems with specific groupings of cytokines that they shot me down. And the question was, where was the article published? It came out of the University of Birmingham, England. These brilliant doctors put it together in 2017 that the inflammatory cytokines are associated with depression. And we know that in people who have no trauma, but they have autoimmune disease. In autoimmune diseases, this interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor alpha layer levels go up high. And what they get besides their Crohn's disease or their arthritic rheumatoid arthritis, they also get emotional problems. The most common is depression. So they've already shown that these inflammatory cytokines can cause depression. But there's an incredible cadre of doctors under psychiatry who don't want to acknowledge that because it now changes it from just an ethereal state of being where they're just depressed and now converts it over to a biochemical cause. Yeah, I was going to ask I, I wanted to ask you that, well, that quickly. So for people listening or watching, the reference to Imperial College was so... Mark was Mark and his, his, his esteemed, esteemed colleagues in the USA and you in the UK were invited to um, a, a not a commission, it was a, a round table event with Imperial College and Defence Medical Services, DMS Mark is what it is over in the UK to right. present your findings and again Mandy was there as well to present the findings and, and explain just what you've explained in this, this interview now and, uh, and so the, the, the so it was basically, now you're talking rubbish. For the most part, it was the, you, the response to you, Mark, and Andrew Marzell as well, right? As well, right? It was, right. no, talking rubbish, piss off. We don't want to listen to your research, no matter how uh, how verifiable it is. Apart from, I think the Surgeon General was on board, right? Yes. Okay. And just so that, just the backstory to that is my understanding, is that Imperial College, they are responsible for the, the psychiatric research and treatment for DM, for Defence Medical Services for the MOD. And what, Mark, you've been outlining here is this is not purely a psychiatric issue. It is a physiological issue, neuro, neuroendocrinology, Physiology. neurophysiology, which would mean, this is, I'll say it, you don't have to say it, which would mean if this is the case and was to brought in and accepted by Imperial College, by DMS, what Mark and all of his colleagues are saying is that it would essentially mean less money for research for Imperial College and uh, less reliance on psychiatry. That, and that's one of the issues, right? I would think so. You know, I didn't go in there to try and um, in, take anything from anybody. I was looking at a collegiate relationship 
you know, where we can share and to come out with uh, with what my goal here in the United States is stop the suicides, stop the destruction of individuals, families, husbands, brothers, sisters, whatever. Stop it, put them back in. And what you said, in the United States, we have a million incarcerated military where an article came out, 98% or 96% of them all had history of traumatic brain injury. And that was the precursor. So in my end stage of living, my goal is to get into the incarcerated military and to be able to show that just like their brothers outside of incarceration, they have the same biochemistry, the findings, and that you fix that, you fix the person. Yeah, they become got people, highly functional. I got friends stuck in the cycle now, Mark. They're stuck in the cycle of 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 medication, you know, narcotics and uh, psychiatry, and they for years, and they get nowhere, and all and all they're getting closer to is the bottom of the but the bottom of the pit. They get closer to the bottom of the pit, and they don't get out from there because yeah. there's only one option I'll see, and it's, it's got it needs to be it needs to be fixed, you know. Right. Um, you've got a hard stop, haven't you? At nine. At nine, yeah. I'm patient. Yeah, uh, have we have, have we uh, have we covered? Is there anything else you want to cover before we finish off? Um, um, it, we are going to be, uh, we're in the process of opening up the UK for receipt of our products. As you know, we've had a number of um, uh, military from the UK uh, come to the United States and uh, receive treatment because the uh, availability of some of our testing, which are basic testing here in the United States, are not available in uh, the UK. I know it because there's a, a doctor that I interact with uh, in Bournemouth, who, um, you know, has shared with me some of the laboratory testing and so forth. And uh, so we're going to be uh, probably in 30 to 60 days uh, be able to ship to uh, the UK our primary kit. And this is the kit that has already shown in, without doing lab tests, without doing medication or hormones, just this kit had a 42% improvement in 30 days. We're doing a 90-day program. What was it called again? I was going to, yeah. What it, it called? It's called the Tri-Kitten. It's at um, Millennium, M, uh, with two L's and two N's, MillenniumHealthStore.com. Uh, but if they want to get the uh, the hard paper, the, the report on the product and composition, it's at dhpusa.com, dhpusa.com. And that has a lot of scientific on it, as well as the um, TBI help uh, now org, O-R-G. So we're educational based, uh, you know, it's about sharing the information. I don't hold anything back. Uh, docs come to me, what can we do? How do we do it? And I train, we've trained about 600 docs. Um, we were supposed to train the doc in Bournemouth, but COVID happened. We've trained eight docs in uh, Canada. We're in about, what, 14 countries, Brazil, um, the islands. Um, let's see, uh, we have a lawyer from uh, uh, France. Uh, you know, so we're in the process of getting out that COVID really curtailed our ability uh, to disseminate the information faster. Let me know when the kit's available for the UK in the UK. I, I'm gonna, I want to try for myself. I want to pick up a kit, try for myself, definitely. Um, and uh, I, pl thank you for your time again. And thanks for what you're doing. And I'm looking forward to speak to Andrew Ma as well, who's oh, like yes. a, you know one of the best advocates for going through your research and treatment um, and that and the whole issue. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah, he he impressed uh, he impressed the. Uh, uh, Surgeon General and his attaché uh, when we were there. In fact, after Andrew stood up and gave his preamble to my presentation, and then my presentation had 459 cases, and they ignored it, okay? Basically ignored it and then attacked me. And, you know, I understood it, so I didn't take it too viscerally, but uh, I did take it viscerally because it meant denying uh, guys like you and your brothers and sisters from getting an uh, access to an option that we've proven with over 380 military and over 3,000 civilians that it works from all walks of life. So it's not just yeah. military, it's everybody. Well, there's momentum there now, so to keep it going. Um, yeah. And just 
Keep doing what you're doing and Thank you. appreciate everything. Thanks a lot, Mike. Anything we'll I can do to help, let me know. Thank you, Hugh. Talk to you and hopefully I'll see you there in London. Fingers crossed. Ah, will do. <laughs> Take care. Catch you later, bud. Bye, mate.